time now for the Weekly Word with Professor Stephen Hines, myself, Jason Spies, and today we're being joined by Paul Dreesen. He's a senior fellow and policy analyst for a Committee for a Constructive Tomorrow, also Congress of Racial Equality and the Heartland Institute. He also has been in a number of free market human rights and environmental think tanks. We're very happy to have Paul Dreesen join the conversation today in just a moment. But first, I want to take this moment to thank our fine sponsors here at the Crude Life Media Network. They literally keep our lights on. Over the past few months, I've told you about how unbelievable Hatch coaching is. Don't just take my word for it. Listen to what Christy Huber, president of the United Way of Cass Clay, says about Hatch coaching. I think it's a really exciting time for our young leaders today because um, leaders like Eric Hatch are changing the face of what it means to lead an organization or what it means to lead a brand. He's changing that. For many years, I think that the, the gold standard of leadership has been somebody who is very polished and has it all together or seemingly has it all together and throughout the years. Um, I think that we've now, especially with technology and social media, we are drawn to what's real. To find out more about Hatch Coaching or to have Eric Hatch speak at your event or company, visit HatchCoaching.com. That's HatchCoaching.com. Or call 701-212-1572. That's 701-212-1572. All right. Well, here we are this week on the Weekly Word, and we're joined by Paul Dreesen. And so here's what we'd like to do before uh, uh, Professor Hines gets into uh, his, his weekly lecture here. Let's, let's start off by giving you a, a quick plug for your organization. What's some of the things that you have going on in your world today? Okay, Paul, uh, what's going on in your world? Well, I'm working on, as I always do, on a ton of different articles covering anything from data breaches to uh, energy development, uh, public lands, global warming, climate change, eco-imperialism. I cover the gamut and I enjoy writing about these things, have for a long time, get a lot of reports and articles published every year, uh, do a variety of radio shows like with you guys, and uh, basically trying to keep people better educated on all these topics because there's a lot of disinformation out there, a lot of fake news, a lot of misunderstandings, and these are things that affect our daily lives, so we need to know the facts about them. Uh, Outstanding. uh, Before we get into uh, the topic du jour, uh, I wrote down eco-imperialism. That's a a unique term, and I think that's a great term, and I think that's going to set the stage for so many different things. But what is your definition of eco-imperialism? It's basically using environmental values and environmental principles as a cudgel, as a, uh, a wedge or a hammer to force people to accept reductions in their living standards or prevent them from improving their living standards in the name of saving the planet from pollution or climate change or whatever the topic du jour is, uh, essentially misusing our environmental ideas and ideals and principles and laws and regulations to, to block development of energy and natural resources that are really essential for our well-being, our health, our planetary health, uh, forcing us to use, for example, renewable energy that actually has far more environmental impact than fossil fuels based on misconceptions about man-made climate change. So those are the sorts of things. And it's my focus was when I developed that term and used it for the title of my book was a focus on Africa and other developing regions where they were being prevented from improving people's lives and saving lives and getting rid of malnutrition and disease in the name of the environment and the planet. Uh, But as I was reminded after the book came out, these same things are being done in Europe and the United States where they use the same environmental ideas and and, uh, goals to to force us to not develop things or to roll back our living standards. So that's the basic concept. I told you, Jason, Paul's quite articulate. Okay, I thought I thought you were going to jump in there, Steve. So I thought I'd uh, give you a 
quick second there, but um, well, I think that's interesting. The one thing that uh, I I took away from that eco imperialism, and I guess I'll kind of direct this a little bit, and we can take it from there, is the f- renewables. Because over the last probably five years, you know, there's been a um, I guess not a push, but there has been some public conversation about traditional fossil fuel companies, oil and gas companies, getting into some of the renewables, whether it's mandated through ethanol, but even to the uh, wind and solar, you know, that sort of thing. Some of them ran ad campaigns with uh, scientists and, you know, white lab coats looking into solar, et cetera. Um, And you mentioned that it's can be deemed a little bit more harmful to the environment or some, that's what I heard, a little more harmful to the environment than, than what the actual perception might be. Did I hear that right? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, the whole thing, the big rap against fossil fuels is that they supposedly change our, our planetary climate. Uh, and there's certainly a supposed consensus on that. It's a fake manufactured consensus that has nothing to do with reality. Uh, but the, re- the fact of the matter is that climate has been changing on our planet since the dawn of time and always has, always will. Uh, it's driven by the sun, above all things, uh, some relationship to cosmic rays hitting the planet and causing cloud formation, uh, all kinds of massive changes from time to time in the, the circulation of currents in our oceans, many, many other factors. And the notion that carbon dioxide, which is four hundredths of one percent of the atmosphere, is somehow the solar dominant factor in climate change is just absurd. But it was created, again, as a uh, weapon to use against fossil fuel use. So if we get rid of the fossil fuels, what are we going to use instead? Uh, well, I'm a big fa- I'm a big believer in energy density. How much energy do you get out of an acre of land with fossil fuels, whether it's coal or oil or gas, or if it's nuclear or hydroelectric, you get an awful lot of bang for your bucks. Uh, a few acres of land delivers a huge amount of energy. When it comes to fossil to uh, renewables, so-called wind and solar, biofuels, uh, and the big one of late over in Europe is wood pellets. They chop down American forests and turn them into pellets that are then shipped over to Europe and burned instead of coal to fuel electricity generation. All these things take enormous amounts of land acreage acreage that could be used for growing crops to feed mankind, or acreage that could remain in or go back to habitats for animals and rare plants. So when you're looking at wind and solar and biofuels, you're talking about millions and millions of acres to replace the fossil fuels that could come from hundreds and hundreds of acres. And you're blanketing them, these acres, with massive industrial facilities, wind turbines and solar panels and crops, and you need enormous amounts of water for the crops. You need all kinds of rare metals and plastics and so forth for the wind turbines and solar panels. They're up there basically permanently. What you're talking about, wood pellets, you're talking about cutting down enormous forests that are going to take decades or more to grow back and burning them in essentially inefficient systems to generate electricity that you could be getting from coal or natural gas or nuclear yeah. power. Also, Paul, you know, it's the uh, capital formation that uh, renewables has yet to answer, and that is how do we uh, how do we create the capital? Which, in other words, that naughty word, making money. Uh, and paying taxes, et cetera. How do we, how do we have a, as they try to say, a hundred percent renewable world that really will not create any capital? It may, in some ways, you could make the analogy to uh, socialism that you spend, you take in X amount of money and you spend it all every year. Yeah, and what's driving the wind and solar and biofuel industries really is not free markets and capitalism and, and you know, uh, economic prosperity except for the few. Essentially what's driving those 
particular industries and energy systems is a lot of legislative mandates and tax breaks, as well as special uh, arrangements for uh, requiring the the electrical grid, for example, to take electricity from wind and solar and pay top dollar for it whenever that electricity is being generated, whether you need it at the time or not. So on a day when you've got really hot weather or really cold weather and there's no wind or the sun is terrible for solar, you're getting no electricity. But then suddenly later on, another day, another week, another month, another time of the day, you've got this massive surge of electricity and you don't really need it just then because there's not as much demand, but you have to pay for it anyway and you have to pay it at a certain level uh, that's way above the going rate for electricity. So the guys generating that juice are making a fortune, but the people that are buying the electricity are paying through the nose for it at and paying whether or not they need the electricity right then or not. This happens all the time over in Germany, for example, where the Swiss buy the electricity at uh, bottom, the, the bottom of the heap price and use it to pump water and to pump storage units. And then when the Germans really need the electricity the next day, they're selling it back to the Germans at 30 cents a, a kilowatt hour compared to the eight or 10 cents we're paying here. So it destroys jobs in the process as well, but it puts a lot of money in the pockets of the legislatively favored few. And another thing I was gonna uh, add, Jason, uh, 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 as you know, uh, Paul has, is a, a, a very much of a published writer besides the books, just recently posted something that showed up at town hall uh, on how on federal lands, but I think one thing that uh, Paul and I had talked about is the Keystone and Pipeline, which is uh, it continues to be a uh, a hot topic. Uh, although I couldn't help but notice, Paul, uh, in Sunday's uh, New York Times, uh, they gave Bill McKibben a chance to once again uh, ask uh, people uh, with. Uh, large financial firms to stop investing in fossil fuels or pipelines or anything related, which uh, which always sounds better than it, than it is, and it always looks like it might happen, but it doesn't. Many, yeah, many, it's many, always something over the next horizon. But well, and, and it's, a, it's, it's the fiduciary responsibility of these people who are handi- handling other people's money that they invested in the in the best investments possible, and of course that our uh, I, I'm going to use this word in our sense of the way of meaning right now. It's renewable. That is, it creates capital, and it will be there tomorrow. Where, as I asked a while back at a conference, what about the technology risk for any renewable? Uh, let's say, a solar project or wind project, and it's, it, within three or four years, it's no longer viable or it's no longer competitive. Yeah, and it all depends on the legislative and regulatory environment. But here's a good example of what you're talking about. The CalPERS system, California Public Employees Retirement System, has always been driven by ideology and political correctitude and not by fiduciary responsibility. So... They, they make all their projections for how much is going to be in their system based on the assumption that it's, the system is going to grow in value by 8 or 9% per year, when in reality it's growing by 2 or 3 or maybe 4% a year. So they're always going to have a growing shortfall in the billions of dollars from what they have to pay out versus what they actually have in the system. And why is their system performing so badly because it's driven by ideology. For example, a few years back, they made a directive that they were not going to invest in Israel or Taiwan because those are politically incorrect. So where did they invest their money? In that towering monument to capitalism, Argentina. (laughs) And of course, Argentina is crashing and is still crashing. So... uh, the uh, CalPERS retirement accounts were also crashing. And this has been 
the gain stay of for so many other of these retirement accounts that are driven by ideology uh, and you get this with the with endowments for some of the universities where there's a lot of pressure for them to disinvest in anything that's related to fossil fuels and get into all this other junk area of uh, uh, bonds and stocks in renewables, for example, and then they perform badly and they don't have the money they need for scholarships and capital improvements on the campuses. So back to your point, this is the fiduciary irresponsibility and people that are making those decisions on the ideological basis should be fired from their jobs because they're, they're being irresponsible to their, their, to their constituencies. Well, I think that's inevitable, I mean, especially in the financial markets. If you don't, if you don't perform... Uh, and, and with uh, an organization like Kelpers, which I've had to deal with for 20 years, and I've always wore a clothes pin on my nose when trying to talk with them. But uh, it, it, it just staggers me that Kelpers continues to maintain a, 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 a prejudice for these, uh, uh, wouldn't this be nice Beach Boys kind of ideas that never pan out. So I think that over time, anybody who is stuck with ideology and investing will not survive. Yeah, uh, absolutely and- right. Good point. And you see the same thing with the Chicago system, retirement system, the Illinois system, Connecticut. Uh, a lot of these very blue states and communities are going down the same path. And ultimately, I think what they have in mind is that the rest of us in the United States will have to bail them out. That all of us other taxpayers, the 95% of the counties that voted for President Trump in 2016, we are going to have to pony up the money to bail out this, all these blue state and blue county, blue city people that want to be as irresponsible and ideologically driven as they feel like, and somebody else should come to the rescue down the road. <laughs> that, to me, is just obscene. Well, and then, and then you have this whole notion of job creation, which is a, a special interest to you, Jason. Uh, the, as I understand it right now, as the, uh, I don't even know if the bill is passed today, the, the enormous bill, but uh, renewable, the, the renewable industry, I think there are 19 or so uh, solar manufacturers who are all uh, certainly in the red, and unless they get some kind of consideration, the new tax bill will not survive. So much for the job creation. Uh, many of the, uh, uh, let's say, the green groups talk about, well, listen, we're just transitioning. There's going to be this great job creation. Well, wait a minute. Unless you have uh, capital formation, there's no job creation. I'm, I'll tell you, what, I'm going to jump in real quick here for just a second. Uh, and um, uh, Professor Stephen Hines, and we've also got uh, Paul Dreesen, Senior Fellow Policy Analyst for the Committee for a tr- uh, Constructive Tomorrow, Congress of Racial Equality, Heartland Institute, and other free market human rights and environmental think tanks. Okay, see, I found it, and I, I was uh, just wanted to get, re- read it real quick that, to let you know I do have it. Um, so, uh, But I wanted to uh, kind of talk a little bit about what you brought up, which is the you know the bigger picture, which is the the tax relief, and also, um, and I'll even bring in subsidies to a certain certain degree because to me it is um, money that is supposed to be based on the theory of of trickle down economics, which is now that the smart capitalists you know quotes around there have the money, are they going to trickle it down into either research and development or exploration or whatever it is to keep the economy going? Well, over the last decade. The shale revolution has done very well for the mining industry, very, very well. And it's created more, it's the one that's created jobs. Over the last decade, it's the only industry that's created jobs. And um, what I'm wondering, oh, hang on. What, I, what I'm wondering is as, as we now are, this mad rush for the global economy happens, and we seem to be ushering in global trickle down economics. 
I'm wondering what that means for the American energy industry. And, and Paul, am I, am I too far out into space on what I'm talking about, or am I anywhere near uh, a ballpark uh, with, with, with kind of connecting some dots? Well, I think you're pretty much on target. Uh, we can go back for a second to this idea of energy density. How much energy do you get out of a particular quota of land or the resources that you pull out of that land, uh, the amount of metals and other and other energy that goes into creating the energy that you're trying to get out of the land, uh, and related to that is the jobs. One of the other big things that we're hearing more and more from the uh, wind and solar and biofuel guys is that those renewable energies create jobs, thousands more jobs than coal and oil and natural gas. And at some level, that's true. But <laughs> the bizarre part of it is that renewables are not job density either. They're, they are they're as poor in that area as they are in energy density in order to get, say, a, a megawatt of electricity from coal or gas or uh, nuclear, you're talking very few jobs and you get that kilo, that megawatt or that gigawatt of energy. And with wind and solar, you're taking a hundred jobs or a thousand jobs to get the same amount of energy. So you're you're requiring far more people to get the same amount of energy, but that drives up your costs of producing that energy, and anybody that uses the energy you're producing has to pay a lot more, and so that end user ends up having to cut jobs. The whole system is so grossly inefficient, the only way it ever is sustained is with more mandates and subsidies that are sucked out of the rest of the economy, damaging that other, the rest of the entire economy even more. Well, and there's, and then there's always this notion of, of and let's just take storage, for example. There's this, uh, yes, uh, solar and wind will be more effective if we have battery storage. Although it's just, it's sort of like cold fusion uh, or any number of other, other sort of promising things, they never come to fruition. So I have this wonderful quote that goes right with what you're saying, Paul. Often creativity is ruined by throwing more and more money at premature ideas. And that can only be done by governments and people who don't know what they're doing. Yeah, that's absolutely right. That's a great quote. Let me give you a practical example of that. This is based on some of my own calculations. So if we're going to use wind turbines to replace all the current U.S. electricity generation that's coming from a little tiny bit from wind, about 2% of it and the, most of the rest from nuclear and hydroelectric, but the bulk of it from gas and coal. And suppose you're going to have to charge batteries on top of your daily generation. You're going to charge batteries for just seven windless days in a row. So you have backup power. What are you going to need in terms of wind turbines to replace the gas and coal that's out there? Uh, you're going to need something on the order of 14 million 1.8 megawatt turbines that go 400 feet in the air and are going to cover acreage twice the size of California. And then if you're going to have backup power so that you have these batteries that you're going to charge to give you seven days of backup power for windless days, you're going to need 650 million of these Tesla battery packs, the 100 kilowatt hour battery packs that they have on the market right now. And that's going to sprawl across still more acreage. So how the heck is any of that? sustainable and all of that stuff is going to require enormous amounts of steel and copper and cobalt rare earth elements fiberglass uh, concrete by the by the thousands of tons to build those turbines and batteries and transmission lines and all that's going to require enormous amounts of earth removal and mining and processing, smelting and manufacturing. And you can't even do that stuff with wind and solar without massive battery backup. Because can you just imagine running a smelting operation and in the middle of it you don't have any electricity because the sun stopped shining or the wind stopped blowing and have all that steel, that melted metal freeze up in your smelting operation? It's just insane. 
insane. It's not ecological. It's not sustainable. And the amount of mining that you have to do is way, way above what we're doing right now for fossil fuels. So the whole thing is just ideological fraud, basically. <laughs> well, and one of the things uh, that strikes me is, as we were saying earlier, Paul, that uh, none of this discussion, whether it's in Europe or in the U.S., considers at all the underdeveloped parts of the world, Africa, South America, Central America, Asia. Uh, I noticed in the news yesterday that uh, because of a political dictate by the Chinese government, they're trying to transition some of their smaller communities to natural gas, but they don't have it. Yeah, yeah, oh, oh, good point. Uh, and that's again this whole thing of eco imperialism. We don't want these the we I'm not saying we, the environmentalists, the far left don't want these countries to develop because then they need they will become middle class consumers and that'll take more out of the earth. So they would rather give them a little bit of wind and solar power so that they improve their lives a little bit and they have a light bulb in their hut and they have a one cubic foot refrigerator and that sort of thing. But they well, really don't, don't want the them to develop. Oven, Paul. You forgot the nuclear oven. Or the, right. The solar yeah. oven. Yeah, the solar oven. So bottom line is they don't want those poor countries to get rich. And what I tell the poor countries is, don't do what rich countries are doing now that they are rich. Do what rich countries did to become rich. <laughs> exactly. Well, I got a question for you. Uh, you seem like you'd be able to answer this and have and, and probably enjoy it too. Um, one, one of the things that I often say is is I believe it's fact. It's but people think it's political. I, I call it the religion of environmentalism. And the reason I call it a religion is because I use the literal definition. And a lot of times someone who is part of a religion blindly follows a faith or blindly follows something. And I'm not sold on the science. I'm with you that we're, we're, there's more evidence in science that the earth is hooked up to the sun, like a lamp is hooked up to a power outlet, than there is anything else. And I've been on record saying, you know, one volcano goes off, and that equals 15 generations of humans, I think, or five generations of humans. And and I'm also, I'm not a catastrophist, so I just don't believe in the whole climate change uh, fear factor type of a thing. And so I call it the religion of environmentalism. Like I said, I think it's more of a factual statement than it is in a, a political statement, because we don't get into politics too much on the show. But uh, what's your thought about the, the, the phrase uh, religion of environmentalism? Oh, I think it's absolutely true. It's replacing Christianity, Judaism, Islam, whatever the other religions are that a lot of these people just despise as, as a source of humanity's uh, ways of dealing with nature and so forth. And they're basically going back to pagan religions, Gaia, and they're happy to sacrifice millions of poor people around the planet on the altar of Gaia in the name of saving the planet from humanity. Uh, and let me leave you with this, too. Let's say we're going to have more carbon dioxide in the air and more warming over the next several decades or century. That's going to spur plant growth. It's going to make people's lives better overall. It's not going to cause massive uh, extreme weather events and so forth. But look at the opposite. If you've got colder weather with less CO2 in the atmosphere, you're going to have reduced arable land, you're going to have shorter growing seasons, you're going to have more famines, and that's going to really hurt humans a lot. I would rather have more CO2 in a warmer climate than less CO2 in colder uh, for the good of the planet, for the good of animals and, and uh, forest and grassland habitats, for the good of our crops and humanity. And this is something that the Bill McKibbins and Al Gores and Obamas and so forth never want to talk about. But we need to bring that up. Well, and it's interesting that uh, as far as solutions, the only solution that has been come up is with, uh, from the green community is re reducing uh, emissions. And the truth is the quickest, cleanest, cheapest way to reduce, if that's what they want, to reduce emissions is energy efficiency. 
Well, that's one of them. The other is nuclear power, which they absolutely detest. But energy efficiency can come in a wide variety of ways, and I'm all in favor of that where it makes economic sense. But if you're going to have to spend $5,000 uh, on your house to, to improve its efficiency by a few percent and save yourself a couple hundred dollars a year in energy costs, it's going to take a lifetime to recoup those costs. So it, depending on where you live and what kind of house you already have and what kind of energy efficiency you're talking about, uh, that could be a really good old idea or a not so good idea. Uh, but they, what they never want to talk about is nuclear power, which if they're opposed to CO2 emissions, you would think they'd jump on top on that as a great savior for the planet. But they hate nuclear and hydroelectric as much as they hate, as they hate fossil fuels. Well, Paul, I would say this. My background uh, for the last 20 years has been in energy efficiency. I helped the... Uh, company grow from uh, 11 people, uh, high efficiency uh, lighting solutions for uh, industrial settings. Uh, and one of the things that we were able to do in that setting, and I, and I think probably the real, the real solution centered around business rather than residential. But anyway, the one thing you could do uh, if you were going to do energy efficiency in that setting is you could document and verify everything that was said to be said. So in some ways, I, what I'm talking about is now the uh, upcoming and coming at us like a freight train, Internet of Things, that provide uh, two-way connectivity to all things. We'll never have to have another modeler or predictor. Why? Because we'll be able to measure all in real time. Mm -hmm. yeah. And that's my, I, I, that's my vision, is, yeah. is that the Internet of Things right now uh, and nobody really is talking much about it. I'm surprised that General Electric doesn't talk about it more. Uh, they have a, have a program that I think should be much more successful called the Industrial Internet, which is the Internet of Things for business. Yeah. And, 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 and you can take 100 houses and do three light bulbs each, and you have almost nothing. You can do that to one or two facilities, and guess what? It's 100 times more efficient. And it also can be proved. Yeah, Boy, I think those are all good ideas. I just replaced a fluorescent light system in one of, one of my rooms here with an LED pseudo fluorescent. It looks like a fluorescent, the same shape and everything, but a whole bunch of little tiny bulbs pop uh, that turn on. It gives me twice as much light for half the electricity use. And it's well, got a 25-year uh, guaranteed right. life for this system. Well, let, let me just tell you a, a little vignette about uh, some work. I did uh, communication and uh, lobbying in the states and out in Washington. But we did uh, the entire fleet of uh, Coca-Cola in North America maybe six, seven years ago. It was a $50 million project. Why did they do it? Because the rep it got repaid in one year, plus they increased the light level. So yeah, that's a terrific problem. accomplishment. Well, and, and, and what I was able to do for Coca-Cola, certainly in uh, a very environmentally sen uh, sensitive uh, state, California, uh, we helped them get uh, headline and coverage for the reduction in their consumption and its impact on the California environment. That's I mean, fantastic. Some showed up for this a news conference we shared with Coca-Cola and demonstrated how it can be done. Now, uh, high-efficiency fluorescents are really being replaced by LEDs, uh, and I don't want to get too technical, but one of the problems with LEDs has always been it's a, it's a huge heat source. So many of the solutions out there, including what you're talking about for yourself, are, have been solved by reducing the heat so that they are all of a sudden, they have longer life. They provide, certainly done right, they provide twice as much uh, light, and they're using half as much energy. Yeah, and I think that heat is great if you're in North Dakota or Wisconsin in the wintertime. It's not but so great if you're in Florida in the summertime. So uh, you know, there, are, the heat, there are different the considerations. Around, hmm? The heat hangs around the bulbs themselves so it really isn't the heat they generate you know to go down and to go below it has to do with right there at where the source of the electricity is mm -hmm. 
So, well, so here's, a, a, here's an opposite point perspective on the uh, renewables. The universe, the uh, Denver Museum of Art several years back did a quick run through of the idea of replacing some of their electricity use with solar panels on the roof of the building. And they ran the costs and they calculated that they, by saving on their electricity consumption from their usual grid, they could save enough electricity to pay for the solar panels in 25 years. That's how long it would take to recoup their investment. But the panels were only going to last 20 years. So they said, this is not a good idea. Along comes President Obama, and he says, oh, boy, look at standing on the top of that roof. You can see the mountains. I could do a photo op up here. Let's put those panels in. Will the federal government, the taxpayers, will pay for these solar panels, and I'll have a photo op up there. So that's what they did. So they got the solar panels essentially for free for the museum, but the rest of us got to pay for this. Uh, and again, it's a matter of government subsidies, government mandates versus the free market and something that really makes economic and energy sense. So well, it is, it is uh, where it works, where, it's, where it makes scientific and economic sense, go for it. Where it's all forced down our throats, I don't think it's a good idea. Exactly. It's a beauty contest, and that's what uh, Jason, you know, in North Dakota, one of the things, and you, may, I think you know this, Paul, Jason's been covering really effectively the Bakken Revolution uh, from the get-go. He's been drawn to it. He has uh, access to every uh, every official in North Dakota. Of course, it helps that it's not a hugely populated state, but he has sit-downs with the governor. But one of the things that stands out for me, and I think this is part of what I wish Ohio and Pennsylvania would figure out, and that is that closer cooperation between the three entities of government, or in, in states actually four, but the, the education, uh, the uh, utility commissioners, uh, uh, the uh, manufacturers, let's say the private sector, but also the other thing that's missing from any federal program is there are no consumer advocates who are protecting the, the rising costs. And one of the reasons why I have advocated against uh, federalizing uh, the electrical grid and leaving it where it is right now is because each state does have a consumer group. So you have, there's this balancing act between environmental, political, and economic. And it is always there. And North Dakota really is, in that regard, I think, a shining star. And I agree. leaving scars on the earth. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I think Pennsylvania and Ohio kind of get it. And they're heading in that direction and they're doing a lot with fracking. But <laughs> go across the Pennsylvania border into New York where they ban fracking and they don't give a hoot about the poor people that live on, on the lands that could benefit from fracking and make a lot of money and provide electricity, uh, natural gas for the rest of the state. It's all driven by Albany and Manhattan environmental ideology that we've been talking about this whole show so where you really need the education is in new york and similar states that just are opposed to this and you go over to europe and it's the same problem of germany and so many other places having these rabid environmentalists using every lie in the books to try to stop fracking and keep the keep their countries reliant on russian gas for example well and pipelines paul i mean I follow, uh, we had Jim Willis on uh, the Weekly Word a couple of weeks back who, who publishes daily, uh, a, uh, uh, it's called a Marcellus uh, Drilling News. And one of the things they're fighting, even in the states where they have an enormous amount of opportunity for fracking and natural gas and for feedstock, by the way, the thing we haven't talked about, that is the creation of things like plastics. Plastics used to be a swear word. Now it's the way we get sanitation in many parts of the world. And it's the way we get computers, computers and cell phones. <laughs> Don't exactly. forget about that. Exactly. <laughs> but, but Ohio and Pennsylvania, uh, in their uh, state uh, governments, they are still fighting like children over a pipeline or allowing a company to do more fracking. Uh, 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 even an absurd example is West Virginia. 
Uh, as Jim, had, Jim Willis pointed out, uh, the Chinese government has promised $84, $85 billion uh, to invest in infrastructure and in sh- and fracking and all uh, in West Virginia. Now, of course, whether China will ever live up to a promise, that's a different discussion. But uh, even in West Virginia, there is a very slow update while they've lost all those coal jobs. And that, of course, drives me crazy. Yeah. And West Virginia does have some good shale areas. And they and there, benefit and there tremendously are from that. You're right. They're a focal point. And, and, and not, so not only just the uh, resources, it's a perfect place. It's almost like Chicago used to be uh, as far as distributing uh, goods and uh, natural gas to other states. They are centrally located. Uh, they provide, you know, if they, you, we didn't do anything other than build pipelines in West Virginia, it would make an enormous impact on how much, uh, how much we are able to uh, power these cleaner natural power plants, et cetera, et cetera. And do, and do not just uh, uh, tight oil and feedstock. Yeah. All right, here we are. Absolutely true. Uh, a weekly word. We're going to wrap up here. We got. I'm looking at the clock, so we kind of probably should get into some closing thoughts and uh, and everything along those lines. So we kind of started the conversation about equal imperialism, and so I'd like to I'd like to kind of bring it back to that a little bit, whether it's through pipelines or whether it's through the jobs or whatever, whether it might be, because equal imperialism that that says that we're going to use. E, the economy basically to create a new sort of imperialism and I do think in fact one of the things that for me I, I got into uh, the oil and gas industry um, as, as a reporter and everything and one of the things that I found right away was they were kind of getting picked on a lot and like coal and it was this uh, sure at times it was fair but at other times it was like that that's just downright being picked on by by people and so that's kind of what i think of when i hear eco imperialism is that there it 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 brings it to where you almost are in a in a term where there's some a war going on and uh that that, that's my i guess perception of that and i'll I'll transition over to paul right now and you know talk talk a little bit more about that eco imperialism as we kind of wrap up a little bit just kind of you you did it earlier but just now that we've fleshed out a, a little bit more of the conversation just kind of reset it and uh, as we summarize here yeah thanks that's a uh, excellent point you're making and to me the bottom line with eco imperialism is it's usually a bunch of well off elites in places where all they have to do is sit around and think and talk and never have to create jobs or make payroll or any of that sort of thing. But they live very comfortably themselves. They never stop to think how much of their own lives is based on fossil fuels, oil and natural gas, uh, coal for electricity, for petrochemical feedstocks, and so forth. So one of my proposals in a recent article is that if you're going to have all these anti-fossil fuels, anti uh, anarchists showing up to oppose the Keystone Pipeline or some other pipeline like Dakota Access Pipeline, you should impose some rules on them because you don't want them to be hypocrites when they're camped out there. So for all these anarchists that show up and they're going to protest pipelines and fossil fuels, we need to prohibit petroleum-based synthetic fibers like clothing and tents and sleeping bags, clothing that's derived from fibers that are grown and harvested and manufactured using fossil fuels, and that means cotton and all those other things, uh, prohibit the f- computers and cell phones that have plastic housings or plastic uh, base for the motherboards, uh, pro- to prohibit any transportation to and from the protest sites in airplanes or vehicles that are fueled or manufactured with hydrocarbons, <laughs> on and on and on like that, and that will shut those places down. But the you know, bottom line is these people are complete hypocrites. They don't think anything through, but they're happy to jam their ideologies down our throats as long as they are not affected by their own ideologies. And that's eco-imperialism. And I'll just add one uh, an extension to uh, this discussion, Jason, and sort of follow up. 
one of the things that's happening uh, out of uh, uh, Houston, et cetera, is now that we're exporting liquid natural gas to uh, China and to uh, uh, Asia, well, Asia, which is part of China, but other parts of the world, this liquid natural gas is replacing wood chips, cow dung, dirty, really dirty coal. We have cleaner coal here by far than any of the other countries. And yet it's turned this discussion on its head for the environmentalists. They really don't know how to respond, in a sense, to uh, reducing emissions in other parts of the world while improving the economic development of those uh, continents and those countries. I want to hear one environmentalist. I don't care if it's Bill McGibbon or it's Michael Mann. Uh, I want to hear them discuss the impact of what fracking has done for a good part of the rest of the world. One, where they're getting imports, and the other thing is, with the right technology, much of the world is sitting on a lot of natural gas and shale, including places like Israel. Yeah, absolutely. And if they could utilize that, lives would be improved tremendously, disease reduced, malnutrition reduced, people would live longer and better. Why are the environmentalists opposed to all of that? All right, Paul Dreesen, how about one last plug for your organization and uh, links and uh, websites, all that fun stuff? Yeah, cfact.org, cfact.org is where I post a lot of my articles, has a lot of great information. They do work with students on a lot of campuses. We have organizations, chapters there. We also support little villages in Yucatan and Uganda. Uh, Heartland Institute, of course, is on the forefront of a lot of the climate change information rather than disinformation. Congress of Racial Equality is one of the few free market-oriented uh, civil rights groups ever in existence. So great organizations, uh, cfact.org. You can also find my stuff on townhall.com. And that's going to do it for this week's Weekly Word. Of course, all of our links for our guests are available at thecrudelife.com. Once again, I'd like to thank Paul Dreesen with Committee for a Constructive Tomorrow, Congress for Racial Equality, Heartland Institute, as well as many other free market human rights and environmental think tanks he's a part of. Thank you very much, Mr. Paul Dreesen, for joining us this week here on The Weekly Word. Once again, I'd like to take this opportunity and thank our sponsors. And I'd like to invite you folks to go to the website, thecrudelife.com. Click on our Sponsors tab and see if there's anybody there you might recognize, you might know, you might want to reach out and say hello to, or you might want to do some business with them. We certainly would appreciate that very much. They keep interviews like this for free, not to mention they literally keep our lights on. That's going to do it this week, folks. We'll see you next week. For Professor Stephen Hines, my name is Jason Spies, and this has been The Weekly Word. Music on today's program is written and performed by the Moody River Band. To find out more about the Moody River Band or their music, visit our website, thecrudelife.com, and click on the Musician tab. That's thecrudelife.com, and click on the Musicians tab. Well, now we're gonna have no trouble with the treble. There's no breaks in the breeze. It's just a you and me, baby, singing it like a day. Day. Yeah, we're singing it like they did in the good old days Because we're back to the way Yeah.